Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, this webinar today brings together a panel of industry leaders and experts to examine the effects of the material shortage and discuss its impact on the um, electrical and engineering services sector. Um, a dramatic reduction in global steel production in the early days of the coronavirus pandemic has led to severe ongoing construction and material shortages. Um, throughout 2021, demand is likely to outstrip supply for essential construction and cable products, spurred by the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, today's panel consists of Rob Driscoll, Director of Legal and Business at the ECA, Margaret Fitzsimmons, CEO of EDA, and Dr. Howard Porter, CEO of BEMA. Um, I'd just like to remind you that you can use the questions box on your screen at any time during today's presentation. Our, present our presenters will answer as many of these as they can at the end of the webinar. Um, the session is being recorded and a full replay will be available on ECA's YouTube channel. Uh, with that said, it's over to you, Rob. Thank you, Oliver. Um, I'm going to take you through some slides, hopefully not bore you to death with those, and then we're going to get a really good deep picture from EDA from their survey, which is closed very, very recently, and Howard can give us a picture from a Beamer perspective. Now, the combined effort here from us as a team is to try and refine your picture of what's happening out there. You could maybe compare yourselves with what the overall picture looks like and start to plan. Um, it's not about panicking, it's about planning it today, and we want to try and give you the combination of our expertise in that sense. Um, I've already had some emails from members saying, would it be available afterwards? And as Oliver said, it goes up on the YouTube channel and you can watch it from there. So Oliver, if you could meet me on a slide, please. Yeah. So, um, the things I was going to cover, in which is available in our downloadable guidance now for contractors, is the picture from CLC, which is the Construction Leadership Council. The stats coming out of the EU, but there are more detailed stats available from uh, BEMA and EDA survey, which they can cover. Uh, product marking, which is a big issue coming out post-Brexit. Freight and carriage. Then you've got the contractual issues around materials contracts, client contracts, your supply chain contracts, and the solutions involved in them, which span advanced payment, retention bonds, vesting certificates, stockpiling, free issuing materials, the risk in materials and fluctuation. So that's what we're going to cover very quickly in the PowerPoint. Can you move me on a second? Another slide, please. Yeah. So here you have the statement, or edits, let's say, from the statement from CLC. This isn't the one that was, I believe there was a further one released this morning, um, and a statement from BEMA. The bit in yellow really is the bit that we want people to take notice of, which is that the market, as Oliver described in the very brief introduction there, is suffering from a shortage of availability. So for contractors over the next six, 12 months, uh, the advice for everybody from throughout the supply chain from the top to the bottom is to plan in advance and work closely with your suppliers so that you can deliver your projects on time and don't start to get, come a cropper on some of the contractual issues. If you can move me on a slide, please. Uh, this is just a picture of the, I guess, the state of trade uh, as we are now um, post-Brexit in terms of the deficit. So we import more than we export and the gap was becoming wider. That has reduced somewhat, uh, quite materially in recent years, but we still are heavily reliant on stuff coming out of the EU. Now this I wanted to raise it now because it will come back and become relevant when it comes to product marking in a second. Can we move on a slide? A couple of tables for you outlining the top five construction products imported, exported. Now, although there's things like timber there, you can also see 
that a lot of them are electrical items and are therefore relevant when you're thinking about what actually comes from the EU versus other states. On the right hand side, you've got the table of our top markets for importing and exporting. And you've, again, you can see there which ones we are most reliant on. So when you're planning your conversations with your suppliers or where they may source their uh, suppliers from, think about where it is the products or the component parts of products that you use to assemble uh, pieces of plant or equipment that you might install within your contractual um, offering come from. And then you can start to do your planning. Can we move on the slide? Product marking, I mentioned that earlier. We're basically going through a transitional period post-Brexit, whereby we used to use CE marking, and we are now, during 2021, moving to a 2022 year where only UKCA products will be allowed. Now, there's two problems with that. One is your contracts. The average length of a contract is around 12 to 18 months. Your promise in your contract is generally that on completion, your installation, supply and install, perhaps design as well, will be as required by the contract documents, which could be the contracts as requirements and specification. They may specify products that are CE marked. They may specify products which aren't yet available at completion date in UKCA mark. So where do you get them from? They may specify equal or approved, but you've really got to check those specifications to see what it is and how then you can source it if there is limited availability in the market. At the moment, the intel I think we're all getting from government is that they aren't uh, sympathetic to extending the 2022 deadline whereby only UKCA product marked goods will be allowed in the UK. Um, slightly complicated for Northern Ireland where the marking system will be on a slightly different way of working. Um, you can see from the bottom right hand box there which marks will be allowable during 2021. If you move me through to the next slide, we'll see 2022. Then yeah, there you can see that in 2022, apart from Northern Ireland, where there is both marks are accepted, it's only going to be UKCA. Now, there is limited capacity within testing houses to get products tested, even though they might currently need not too much more to comply with this new mark. The idea really is that they will have to carry it to be viable. Um, so it's about the transition period and it's about the contract duration that you may be signing up specifications that require CE marking, or you may be signing up to contracts which at completion require your goods, materials, and workmanship to comply with all relevant standards at the time of PC, practical completion, in which case the standards will have changed to UKCA by then, and therefore you've got issues to, to double check within the, and contractually manage in that sense. Uh, but again, Howard and uh, Margaret may have more to say on that. Can you move me on a slide, please? So where well are we in terms of contracts and freight? Uh, well, in terms of the risk of materials and everything else, freight's gone up two to three, four hundred percent around the world. So there was a risk post COVID of trying to move goods to where they should be. You had the Suez Canal issue going on, and now the cost of transportation has risen. Um, I don't want to be too contentious with my colleagues, but first thing I guess is checking your supply contracts to you if you're at the bottom of the contractual chain, if you are the last person in the supply and install process then you probably need to have a look at your contracts. Quite often those contracts are signed up to because you have an account with your supplier and way back when you have agreed to terms and conditions, what you do when you rock up at the trade counter is simply call off on those terms and conditions and then get invoiced. 
usually in arrears or up front at point of sale for those. But quite often they are set. They may not include time of the essence for delivery. Um, when what we are really describing here now is if you can no longer uh, turn up the day before you need the materials, knowing that they will be freely available to you, you may have to plan, order in advance, and outline to your supplier that time may now be of the essence because if you can't get them there, you might have to go elsewhere. And this is not to be contentious, this is because you'll have upstream contractual responsibilities to fulfill with your clients, which will need to be met or else you risk being punished in contracts. Um, you've, I guess you've got to think about what happens if any goods are defective. Uh, quite often these contracts can limit or exclude liability for on costs, so they will replace the goods that are defective and proven to be defective, but they won't necessarily pick up the labour bill or any on costs if those goods have been incorporated into the fabric of the building. Um, and the cancellation process is probably the other thing to check. If you needed to cancel to go elsewhere, what are the time constraints on that? There will be a um, reducing cancellation system in your contracts where you've placed orders as to what you can do where you go elsewhere. Um, that may not be a problem for materials that you can reallocate to other jobs, but it might be on something that's more bespoke. Can we move to the next slide, please? Right, contracts above you. Your contracts with your clients broadly split into three areas. Um, the first being JSTT, the standard form of contract in the industry that tends to be responsible for about 70% of contracts. Probably the other 30% is split into either 15 and 15 or 20 and 10 between NEC, which is the favorite contract of choice for public infrastructure jobs than a lot of other uh, public sector jobs. And then the other pot would be the, the bespoke or bastardized versions of these. Most large tier ones and tier twos um, We'll go out and hire a firm of lawyers like I used to be in to amend one of the standard forms of contract in their favour and that will be their bulletproof vest that protects their business. How it deals with these things. So let's just run very quickly through both JCT and NEC. Uh, these contracts tend to be fixed lump sum priced contracts. I, I want to know how much you're going to charge me for doing this scope of works. Um, JCT, particularly the price is based on the contractor's requirements or in the main contract would be the employer's requirements and the specification. We've already identified that in the specification, you'll find products which are to be specified, whether they'll be equal or approved, and whether they need to carry which marking to be compliant with the project. Clause 2.21 might say, well, you've got to carry out those works and supply those materials so far as procurable and that you need the consent of the main contractor if you want to switch them out for any other uh, goods or materials. So A, you've got, you've got to have their written consent. What does so far as procurable mean? We don't know, no one does. Do you want it tested in law? Probably not, you don't want to be in that situation. I would refine that wording. This is where you've got to really manage the contractual risk and say, look, Let's have an upfront conversation about this. There are certain items here, at least, that according to our suppliers, where we've had some robust conversations, may have longer lead in times, may be we can't guarantee availability on time. How do we manage that risk in the contract above us? In 2.3, there is a obligation to proceed regularly and diligently towards completion. And usually on the back of that, there's an LADs clause, a liquidated and ascertained damages clause. I, um, I've seen it in minutes, but it's usually a daily, weekly or monthly rate of damages that will be paid if you're late. Um, it's not a bad thing if the rate is reasonable, but often it isn't. Um, and therefore, you've got to operate the contractual machinery. In terms of how you can do that, JCT splits itself down into two parts, relevant events that allow you extra time, relevant matters that allow you extra money. Um, nothing in either contract definitively helps you out of 
this predicament with the delayed materials. However, um, if you are stuck uh, because of a strike, lockout, or exercise of uh, statutory authority in terms of restrictions due to COVID or being able to imp import materials, that can be a relevant event entitling you to extra time and money. Instruction to change or vary or postpone. Now, if we go back to this unprocurable obligation and looking for their consent to substitute other materials, their consent would form an instruction. But they may not want an open-ended obligation on them following an instruction that gives just gives you carte blanche time for money and time. Um, so that may be where you've got to strike a deal. Uh, any impediment, prevention or default by them or those for which they're responsible can also give you time and money, uh, which might mean a lack of instruction when you've asked for one. Um, so that's, again, another clever means of doing it. Force majeure, you heard a lot about that phrase that previously was just the dominion of, of lawyers like me. It means an act of God. It won't work now. It has to be impossible, not just expensive. JCT doesn't define what force majeure is, um, and it only gets you time, it doesn't give you money. So probably what you're looking at is asking them for a, a, a conversation about what is procurable, a conversation about can you substitute alternate goods and materials, and looking for an act of impediment or prevention if they refuse to cooperate or engage with you on that. They should do, it's in their interest in terms of project and proactive client management. Now, NEC 4 is much more proactive about that. It starts off with a clause around mutual trust and cooperation. Um, you have various options in NEC 4, straightforward fixed price, then option C and D is a target cost, so that's a pain gain sharing pricing system. And option E is cost reimbursable. Now that may then help to uh, share the pain of these things in those options. Option X1 talks about inflation, so you need in the contract data to link that to some indices, i.e. not retail price index, but the equivalent for construction, something like NIDO or the Building Cost Information Service. Option two is change in law. So if if the goods or materials were coming from a foreign jurisdiction and the change in law there meant they couldn't be exported due to COVID restrictions or anything else, you could perhaps rely on that to then give you a compensation event. So my language is changing. I talked about relevant events and relevant matters under JTT. Under NEC, it's a compensation event that gives you both time and money. Um, and NEC works in a broadly similar way under the clauses 60, where there can be a, ch a compensation event for change in dates or for their version of force majeure, which is very formulaic and asks you to um, fulfill certain criteria. Um, and it does require you, and this accounts for both versions of the contract and bespokes, but particularly with NEC, you have to give an early warning notice. And you should do it within eight weeks of becoming aware of the issue. That protects you from having your 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 right to time and money taken away from you. In JCT, there are very prescriptive clauses around asking for an extension of time and or loss and expense. So really, this is about being very proactive and very collaborative in this sense. Can you move me on a slide, please? Just final few bits. In terms of what to think or look out for, if you're sitting there thinking, I'm not sure what he's talking about, I usually just get a subcontract order form or a purchase order. It's one page. Uh, why is he talking about these big complica complicated contracts? You may well find the bottom of that page in very small font, so it's subject to our terms and conditions. Copy available on request or for inspection at our head office or something like that. That contract is incorporated even though you've never seen it, never agreed to it, by agreeing to the purchase order itself, you've agreed to that document. Get a copy of it. There is nothing unreasonable about asking for it. 
uh, asking for copies of any documents that you're that are listed there to be bound by. Have a look for the spec. Try and figure out whether the materials are available. Talk to your suppliers. Look for equal or approved. Maybe carve out the risk with your client and say, look, these relevant events or these compensation events, depending on what kind of contract it is, we need we can't guarantee those materials will be there on time. So we have to have some middle ground between us to make sure the job can still get completed and we won't fall out with each other. Um, said operate the contract, uh, fire off the notices, think about condition precedent or time barring provisions. That's just where you've got an eight, something like an eight week cut off in the NEC. So if you don't issue the notice in eight weeks, you are barred from claiming the right to time or money. Uh, record keeping, you'll need to keep forensic contemporaneous notes. Uh, method statements might help, programming, uh, and this is really because should it really get that bad that you end up with a bit, a bit of a contractual ruck on your hands, fight from a position of strength. We can't help you through these situations if there is no documents to rely on to say what impact this had on your project management. Um, so it's about being upfront and, and uh, exemplary in that sense. Next slide, please. And then finally, some, some kind of added extras. Some people in trying to manage the risk will consider advanced payment or off-site materials agreements or vesting deeds. More or less the same thing. It's the ability to say to the client, will you, all, will you pay me up front for this kit? We will, in a fairly simple legal document, two or three pages, promise that the money is being held to buy those materials those materials, when they're delivered, will be insured by us in your name, held by us in your name, should we go bust, and will be labelled and separately identified for you. And that just hedges the risk and makes sure that you've got some cash up front against this risk and can deal with the lead time. Stockpiling, well, it's a bit of a debatable point whether you've got the space, the storage to stockpile anything, and whether it's the kind of thing you could reallocate if something changes in your contract. Free issue, well, again, the main contractor could free issue you with materials, meaning they issue them for you to install, but then you won't have the profit margin on those materials. So it comes out of your job in that sense. Uh, the risk in materials, this is quite important. Risk and ownership are two different things contractually. Um, quite often they will try and say that the risk stays with the subcontractor until PC of the whole works, but at the very least it would be PC of your works. Um, the JCT common position is that risk should pass when your goods and materials are fully and finally incorporated, because it could be a long time until power's on or heat's on or anything else. Um, but the, more importantly, ownership, they will try and make sure the clauses say, we own it as soon as it comes in the site gates. Ownership always passes in law as soon as items are incorporated into the fabric of the building, regardless of what the contract says. So think about that. Fluctuations, people have asked me about Nido and Spons. They are two indices. Just as we've got the retail price index for uh, indices and the cost of inflation in the consumer market and the general market, Nido and Spons were uh, methods that were originated by the government to measure a basket of goods in certain trades. Um, the government now don't publish them. They outsourced it to the Building Cost Information Service run by RICS, the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors. So you would have to subscribe to those to get hold of those indices. Um, but it does then allow in both forms of contract for the ability to fluctuate either labor and or materials. Um, the only issue with that is in my professional time, so let's say last 15 plus years, my, nearly 99.9% .9 of contracts have fluctuations removed because they don't like the idea of a variable price. Um, so I think that's me if you move us on a slide. That's a whistle stop tour of the contractual issues. I'll pass over to Margaret to give us a bit a more granular picture of product availability. All right. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. I think that's a really hard job you do there. <laughs> very complicated stuff. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Margaret Fitzsimons, and I'm um, the chief executive of the Electrical Distributors Association. Um, in the right hand corner of my slide there, you see the symbol of a chain. And that is, um, we see ourselves as the essential link in the chain between the manufacturers and you, the contractor. Um, and and we see that in many ways, not just in terms of getting uh, a flow of products to you, but also uh, communicating to you. Um, today, I had a meeting with my members of electrical uh, wholesalers. Um, and one of the messages I wanted to get out to them about this whole um, materials issue is the fact that the we in the electrotechnical supply chain are part of a much larger construction industry. So if it's okay with you, I'll go a little bit off piste for a second and give you a look at um, some of the statistics I showed them this morning about the construction industry in general, the market in which we are all ultimately wor working, the much wider market. So if we go to the next slide, please. This forecast is from the Construction Products Association. They tend to be dominated by the very big, heavy side products, um, and the often our products are underrepresented there. But it's important to understand what the overall market is doing uh, so that we can see what's ahead of us when we get involved in the projects. So this slide here breaks down the nine major areas of work as identified by the Office of National Statistics. So on the right hand side of the screen there, you see the 100% total construction in the, in the UK, which is about 150 billion pounds uh, estimated that this year. And this is made up of these nine major areas of work. Um, there's a lot of information on this slide for you to take in, but the first thing to point out is that these numbers in white on the bottom represent the overall size of each of these areas of work. So for example, public housing, the one on the far left, is only 3% of the 100%, 3% of that 150 billion. Um, so probably not an enormously important sector for, for many people. Um, on the other hand, private housing, 21%, I think that's the biggest sector of them all. Um, very, very important. And that private housing sector is about to grow by four, is, is estimated to grow by 14% this year. So if you're involved in private housing, it's very good news for you to a certain extent, to a certain, from, from, um, from a market potential and demand point of view. The infrastructure area is, is the government has been, um, has been, uh, um, which we call investing heavily in infrastructure, encouraging big projects to keep to keep the economy going actually through COVID, and that's to grow by almost 30% this year. So it's very good news for you if you're in infrastructure. So as you can see, this side of these lines, first my first two boxes are housing, and it's all new, and these are the non-housing boxes, and new, and on this side is R, M, and I. Now these numbers here in orange are probably not of relevance to you, but they are the ones that the electrical wholesalers are most important for the electrical wholesalers. So if you're an electrical um, contractor who deals in non-housing RMI, you're likely to be going through an electrical wholesaler to get your products. So if I, I'd like to expand a little bit on some of the, oh, and by the way, just to say, it is expected that the market will grow by almost 13% this year. Um, and another piece to add is that that growth, don't be expecting more and more growth. A lot of that growth has already happened. The first few months of this year have been phenomenal in terms of growth and catch up. Um, and I'll go into that more in a second. If I can go to the next slide, please. So some, a little bit of context around some of those um, figures. So. The construction industry is booming. There's no doubt about it. The, the famous word unprecedented growth and this famous unprecedented word needs to be used for our sector too and how it's growing. And out of the builders merchants in March 21, their sales were 47% up on March last year. Now, they, that's not particularly meaningful because March was the beginning of the downturn, but it's up 23% on March 2019. And the sales out of builders mar merchants in quarter one 2021 are up 15% on March 2020 and 
on 2019. So big, big growth there, which of course will have a knock-on effect on the, on the requirement for electrical work and electrical products. Our own electrical wholesaler members had a record March and April. In fact, we think March was probably the biggest month anybody has ever experienced. And even when we, and, and that's even compared with 2019. April, as we all know, was the, the bottom of the, the bottom of the recession for us last year. Um, and, but all of those sectors I just mentioned um, are experiencing growth. Housing demand is enormously strong and house builders are confident that they will remain strong uh, for the rest of the year. In fact, I don't think they can build houses fast enough and, and they are experiencing huge frustration with shortage of lots of different types of products, which I'll come to in a second. Private housing activity, uh, RMI, we all know that kept us going last year. Um, um, people didn't go on holidays. Um, some people were off work, um, laid off work um, construction sites, and they took to a bit of DIY and RMI in the private sector. And uh, people invested heavily in their homes and in particular in their gardens, where there were loads and loads of shortages of, of products, including outdoor lighting and those type of products. But the main products were fencing and decking last year. Um, public housing RMI is strong but for cladding remediation, not necessarily the traditional type of um, repairs and maintenance we'd expect in a public housing um, situation. Infrastructure demand remains very strong, as I showed you. HS2 is picking up, Sizewell is in the pipeline, and there's a, gov there's, um, a huge pipeline of government infrastructure projects planned. Commercial activity was a bit dull and, and in the doldrums, but that has already, that has picked up much to actually everybody's surprise. Um, but I, would, I think that might be a short term thing because I, I think what it's mainly involved in is fit out work on existing and new retail and leisure units as they make themselves ready and adapt themselves for opening um, with social distancing um, uh, restrictions in place. Um, but there are f very few new of the big types of projects that we all have come to know and expect in that sector. And I think probably there'll be a bit of, um, there may be a bit of uncertainty around that as people work out whether people are actually going to go back and work in offices or whether home um, home working is going to take off and what the proportion or the blend is going to be. Industrial demand is strong on warehouses, but weak on factories. So there are just some of, that's all uh, fairly positive stuff from a demand point of view, but the next slide shows the problems that that brings up. If we can move on to my next slide. Thank you. So this has put huge pressure on supply and price. And there are many reasons for that. There's the after effects of COVID because factories closed down for um, you know, sometimes maybe six back in March, March, April and the beginning of May last year, factories either closed down or cut back on production. There are Brexit related issues that kept it made delays at borders. There were shipping issues where containers were all placed in different parts of the world um, and unable to get to the UK. and but the big thing is that there is unprecedented demand, not just here, but in, in other countries as well. Um, some other things are we're seeing is uh, there's rules on hauliers and uh, cabotage. Apparently, cabotage is the word used to describe what hauliers do, where they take a load to one place and they can pick up other elements to go with that load. And there are new rules around that. There's a shortage of drivers in the UK across many sectors, and it's not just construction, and it's a big demographic problem. Many of our drivers were not from the UK, um, and much of the stuff, much of the driving done was by drivers who are not from the UK. Now they don't want to come here because there are big delays at borders, and it's very hard to fill those posts. Um, so some of that has led to um, products not being transported on trucks at all, but being offloaded onto ships, then carried across in the ship and then loaded into dry, uh, trucks here, and that's leading to delays at ports. Um, one of the examples of that typical products there is timber. Um, there are very long lead times for many key construction products, and that's on the heavy side. Um, and the situation is worse in certain geographical areas. Apparently, if you're in a, a large city or if you're in the backbone of the country, 
you're probably all right, but it gets worse as you go out into the geographical extremities of the country. Um, and many of the manufacturers of building products have placed, ha have got allocation strategies in place. So um, they're only delivering partial loads or loads at a certain time to people. And the big products, big, one of the biggest products at the moment is cement, plastic packaging, the chemicals that go into that, timber, doors, appliances, roof tiles, insulation is another one I don't have, have on that list. I've heard stories of um, smaller builders desperate for cement being told they can have a few bags in five weeks time, impossible for them to complete the jobs they're doing, therefore they're not paid. So this has huge knock-on effects, on, particularly on the, on the heavy side. There is an appeal even by the smaller house building contractors for manufacturers to keep supplying builders merchants um, because manufacturers may be tempted to honor contracts they have with um, let's say the larger contractors and forget this and forget building to the, forget the builders merchants um, but that of course has a big impact on hundreds of small um, businesses operating around the country and and you know our market is probably one of the most fragmented you can come across um, in the in in the whole UK economy. Another problem is the fact that UK is perceived by some smaller, let's say, exporters to the UK as becoming a bit of a difficult market. Um, the margins have traditionally been low, it's a competitive market. And now, because of Brexit, there's higher administration. So smaller suppliers are saying to themselves, mm, too much bother, I don't think I will. Northern Ireland is problematic. There are extra administration costs and um, some reports are saying that it's taking a day to get from one side of the border to the other. And uh, we have had an estimate that the costs are potentially 18% higher to go from one side of the border to the other. And then of course, there's the UK CA mark issues. Um, they're not just for construction, they have an effect across lots and lots of different industries and many people are lobbying the government to get a delay to the deadline dates because um, actually at the end of, by December it's, it may just seem like this is a problem about sticking a label on something. Well it means that you can't sell a, comp a product that has a CE mark so an exporter from abroad can't just put something with CE onto the market and so therefore that the availability of the product could become a problem and they need to get it retested here and as you've heard that there aren't enough testing houses um, even though they're doing it probably exactly the same tests as have already been done to give them the CE mark so it's 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 a really political silly piece of administration that has to be done there. The price the price of a basket of construction products has risen by about seven to eight percent so far this year, but this can camouflage the 40 to 50 percent rise in some products, such as timber. Timber's had a huge increase, um, and these prices are likely to start to feed through the supply chain. Um, there are a number of organizations and trade associations who have issued statements to try and help explain this to customers because you know every step now in the supply chain is having problems. And we need, and, and you know, people need to trust that it is actually a problem and you're not just making it up and you're not just putting the prices up for the sake of um, profiteering or putting the prices up for, to make more margin. There are real constraints in the supply chain and this has got to be explained. So we need com communication and allocation strategies. And what we see in the Electrical Distributors Association is that many of our of the customers of our wholesalers are used to just ringing up the night before or popping in in the morning and saying, can I have 10 of these and four of those for the job I'm working on today? Well, that could now really start to become a problem. So we are trying to say to people, change the way you do that, is have a word with your wholesalers and plan in advance. That all sounds very gloom and doom because in the wider construction industry, some of these delays are can be weeks. You know, it can be eight weeks, twelve weeks to get delivery of some of these roof tiles and various bits and pieces. It's not so bad in our sector. And if we could move on to the next slide, please. Um, if, I just said this is the survey I presented this morning. It literally closed on Tuesday of this week, so it's absolutely. Um, it's absolutely up to date. 
we we had two two sets of the survey if you like we talked to our wholesaler members and then we talked to the manufacturers who supply those wholesaler members and so we got a very good response rate of about 93 companies out of 245 members that's the wholesalers that's about a thousand branches we're representing there and in the affiliated manufacturers 48 out of 80 that's leading manufacturers they're all the no names and brands you will know and love so if we move on these are the biggest concerns that electrical wholesalers have and you can see that since october last year product availability has been their number one business concern and in february of this year manufacturer price increases started to come in as a um, as a concern and that remains their second biggest concern in uh, in this this month and of course, the third point I've just raised there, it's a, they're concerned that their customers don't understand the supply chain problems, such as product availability and price increases. So it's important that you, the, um, the, the electrical contractor, understand these issues so that you will adapt your strategy from a purchasing point of view and also be able to explain it to your clients. Um, it's just really a, um, a very important point that everybody is aware of. And if you move on to the next slide, please. I, 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 after painting a picture of doom and gloom, I think this picture is not too bad. And this is the picture of um, product availability on the more difficult products in the electrotechnical supply chain. So having said that for the heavy side products, it's weeks and sometimes months to get products. We have, we start, we, when we started doing these polls, we asked the wholesalers to tell us the products that were the problem for them. And the products on the left-hand side are the problems that started to um, that emerged. So each month, these were the things they were telling us about: mains cable, twin and earth cable, specialist cable. Um, so this month, what we did was we put, we asked them to please tell us for these problem products what were the typical lead times that um, it was, how long was it taking them to get those products from the manufacturers? And we were expecting a, a, a car crash actually, but in fact, I don't think it looks too bad at all. Anything in orange means that the products can be obtained within one to three days. Anything in turquoise is within seven to 13 days, which I don't think is too bad. However, it is bad if you walk into the trade counter today and say, could I have this for a job tomorrow? Then it is a problem. But it isn't, you know, seven to 13 days, we maybe should be able to sit down and rethink the way we work and plan a little bit better. The worst, on the right-hand side, the numbers indicate the ones that are the most problematic. And the most problematic product for our wholesalers to source at the moment, number one is consumer units, number two is steel trunking and cable tray, and number three is circuit protection. But you can see that even then, it's not, it's not a totally disastrous picture. Um, there is a slightly longer lead time, but you know, with a bit of good planning, everything should be okay. So if we could move on. Uh, we look at the manufacturers. What are their most pressing business challenges? Well, um, you know, last year they were worried about Brexit. What would that mean for their business? Then there was uncertainty in January. What was this new lockdown going to do to business? But now it's all about the increased cost of raw materials um, and the increased cost of shipping. And the and um, and the increasing shortage of raw materials is has emerged as the third biggest um, problem for them this month. So, uh, you know, as as I said, these these raw material there are. I, I think we can anticipate price increases um, in, in the next few months. I don't think they can continue to be absorbed by the supply chain. It's hard to know how much of these, um, uh, how, you know, how big these price increases will be. But we know that shipping has um, has increased dramatically with container prices going from something like 8,000 to 20,000 pounds for a container. Luckily, 
most of the products that come into the UK for our sector are relatively small, so you can get an awful lot into a container and you can share the cost over the container, but there's still huge costs that have to be borne, along with all of this UKCA marking that has to take place. So if we move on, please. Um, and this is, um, again, comparing the cost of raw materials, the manufacturers, what, how, of, you can see here that for um, almost, for, well, 45% of them said that the, the cost of their raw materials had gone up by five to 9% since, Jan, since last, since quarter three of 2020. And 10% or more, um, over 50% said it had gone up 10% or more. So that's quite an increase in the cost of raw materials. Excuse me, I'm just going to cough. <laughs> Sorry about that. If we could pass on to the next slide. Um, well, one very, we had, Howard is going to talk next and he's from BIMA and, uh, you know, this, we at the trade association level are trying to work with each other to, we see our role to look up the supply chain to the manufacturers, look down the supply chain to you, the contractor, and see what are the issues you are both facing and then try and help do our very best to help our members to deal with those issues. Um, BEMA did a fantastically useful um, piece on the problems with steel, steel trunking. It's a global issue. Um, a statement was issued. We sent it around to our members. They found it very useful to be able to spread that out to the marketplace, as you can see there extremely useful and very useful and I think you'll see more of that as we get together as associations to try and um, issue something that will help you in your negotiations with your clients so that they understand what we're all facing. If you want to move on. Oh well this is maybe not of interest to you but it's just um, the UKCA marking is something that is an issue for our supply chain. It's a headache that could lead to a total migraine, I guess. Um, our wholesalers are not particularly concerned by it at the moment, and we see it as our job to make sure they are aware of it and understand it because they've got to um, they've got to make sure that they their their stock rotation planning is put into place to make sure that those CE marked products um, are start to flow out of their businesses first, because it's perfectly fine to use CE marking now, but from the 1st of January, anything, nothing more, nothing new can be put on the market. And there's a bit of lack of clarity about when a thing actually hits the market that needs to be known. If we go to the next slide, please. This, I think, is my final one. Uh, the 20, for manufacturers, this is much more of a concern because they, as the people who put things on the market, it's, it's a problem for them. Um, have I any more slides? Yeah. So, so yeah, this is about the labelling. Manufacturers are uh, we're working we're working with manufacturers to try and educate the market on labelling changes. Uh, if I just move on, that's it. That's that's my little piece. I don't know if that gives you any insight into what's going on. It's very difficult. I don't see anybody, so I, I don't know if anybody's if you're all asleep or if you have any questions. Let's give Howard a chance to comment on what we've said and then uh, maybe we can see what questions come through whilst Howard's talking. Great. Howard, are you on mute? Uh, no, no, I was waiting to be introduced. Um, okay, thank you. Following on from Rob and Margaret, first of all, before I come on to the issue of product availability, there's some clarification on the UK CA mark I'd like to make. Um, at the end of this year, UK CA marks have to be on the product or be available in the packaging. That is a very, very important element that I think was, was um, not quite um, fully explained earlier. So, by the end of 2022, it has to be affixed permanently to the product. But between after the end of this year 
the UK CR mark can either be on the product, permanently affixed, or um, as a label within the packaging so that the user um, can see that it is, uh, it is applicable to the UK CR mark. Now, that doesn't um, mitigate the problems of uh, the, the lack of availability of testing um, houses, etc. But it does mean that in terms of in the marketplace, there is not a requirement to place that logo on the product. Um, but it, I suspect that many will be. And clearly, as we go through 2022, by the end of it, it all will be on the product. But it does mean, and this was actually some lobbying that we did towards the back end of last year, of uh, successful lobbying, I have to say, that that year's grace period that you have to do the product, you have to provide the label, but it doesn't have to be affixed, was something we, uh, we felt was a, a plus point in terms of the flexibility. Uh, and if um, you want further clarity on that, I'm speaking to Margaret and, and Rob, so for your members, we can certainly provide that. Um, now, exactly how that's going to play out, nobody knows. What percentage will be uh, on a label in the packaging, not a fixed product, remains to be seen, because it all depends how quickly products are getting going. But I've been told by uh, one brand who has got 40,000 pieces of equipment that they place in the UK market. And you can imagine relabeling 40,000 products when they only knew what to do in around about November last year uh, is quite an undertaking. So I, I, think, um, I think there's a lot of work going in and we do hope that every, everyone will be ready, but there is that 12 months of, of leeway um, that you can put a label in your packet even if you haven't managed to change your tooling to get the UK CA mark on your product. Uh, and just one further thing, the further complication with Northern Ireland, um, I think if anybody says they know what's gonna happen there, they're wrong, because nobody knows. Um, and But certainly the UK, the UK NI mark will have to be uh, attached. Uh, and I have spoken to manufacturers who are big in Northern Ireland, and they're gonna put every label they can see on it, because it is applicable to the C to CMR, UK CA, UK NI, and I think those manufacturers who have got a big market share in Northern Ireland will be doing that. Whether or not that is allowable and legal remains to be seen. Uh, much of the situation with Northern Ireland is not clear. Um, interesting to hear the comments from earlier in terms of product availability. The survey we carried out that um, I came out this morning, I'm looking at a document in front of on the other screen. Um, we covered a range of the products that BEMA members will provide, and some of it is consistent clearly with, with Margaret's heard from the affiliates that are members within the EDA. Um, but we've asked a wider range of people also into H and V, which is not necessarily into this area. But the, main, the, the biggest areas of concern for BEMA members are semiconductors and finished products. In fact, the number of people who commented on it as a proportion, I think something like 80% commented on the lack of availability of semiconductors, whereas only 50% thought that steel, copper, wood, and packaging, although significant within those other product areas, uh, the really big areas were in semiconductors. And you can imagine in the modern electrical equipment, there's an awful lot of semiconductors going to many things. Not clearly color management, I haven't quite got them in here yet, but in many areas, that's a big challenge. And anything with a screen on it uh, is reliant upon semiconductors, uh, and anything digital and connected, of course, um, use the semiconductors. The other major area we're looking at, finished goods. So that is goods which are manufactured outside the United Kingdom, but are provided within the United Kingdom by our members. And they were 
not quite as effective as semiconductors, but very significant. Um, and I think across all of these areas, it's already been mentioned by the last two speakers, but surprise, surprise, if there are raw material, difficulties in raw materials, shortages of raw materials, the prices on the world market are going up, in some cases, very considerably. Uh, and I, as Margaret mentioned, there's a certain amount of absorption that can be made within markets, um, but inevitably some price rises will come through, if not already coming through into the marketplace. Now, we, were not, we are not allowed legally um, to, to ask our members about prices, so we didn't, um, but we are, I think that's where Margaret's intel might come because there may be some you know, in, imported import informa information into wholesalers, but uh, we can't certainly get that information. When asked how long this would take to play out, I think it very much depends in the sector you're in and the products. Again, the semiconductor areas, I don't, people didn't seem to think that's gonna play out for maybe 18 months. Whereas maybe packaging and steel may be a little shorter, but there were some people think it might be, might be back to normal by the end of this year, um, but they would tend to be in the non-complex product areas, but tending to be the more complex areas, people were thinking we could be in this game for two years. So I think, I think in short, there is an awful lot of concern uh, across the piece of product manufacturers in terms of getting their products. One final thing is uh, when asked, uh, can the lead times you are receiving for raw materials be considered as accurate once you've placed your orders? Um, every single respondee said no. So I think it's fair to say that in the chain, uh, there's a chain above the beam manu manufacturer, it's the raw material providers, and they, nobody said they were confident at all that when they are given a lead time, that that lead time can be trusted and will actually be, will happen in reality. So I think you can see that if the manufacturers can't rely on lead times to make their products, either as partially manufactured or full manufacturer in the UK, um, that clearly leads to greater uncertainty into the wholesale market, and therefore greater uncertainty into the contracting market. Um, so I, I think you can see this is a, a big chain of connected problems that starts off and starts off, let's face it, there's a whole raft of reasons why. I think the one that hasn't been mentioned thus far is the rise of China. So an awful lot of the products, particularly in the areas I've mentioned, semiconductors and finished goods, an awful lot of stuff comes from China. And the Chinese market is going through a very strong resurgence. Um, started off before the rest of the world in terms of the post-pandemic resurgence but China is taking an awful lot of product out of the world market. Um, and there are still the ongoing issues of increased container costs that have been mentioned by both Margaret and Rob. Uh, there is still problems of supply um, following the, the, the blockage of the Suez Canal, which is difficult to comprehend, but it's still finding its way through. And then there is the issues of the, the almost a perfect storm, that there is a very strong resurgence, as Margaret has mentioned, very strong in many areas, um, but a time where the raw materials and therefore the products, I wouldn't say are not there, but you know, they are, there are problems and the problems may get worse. Um, I, well, I can say if the manufacturers we represent are clearly doing their best, to, you know, to to stick to their delivery times, um, but there are some you know, there are some issues happening that are completely outside their control, which is affecting the, their ability. We have raised all these issues with our contacts in government, 
but I think it's fair to say the UK government has relatively little power to change anything in this in this game, um, apart from perhaps uh, in some of the product marking, uh, liaising with the European Union to have more leniency on that marking regime. Um, but as Margaret and Rob said, government coming under pressure, well, our information is that pressure is not likely to deliver any change. Howard, can I ask you a couple of questions? Um, I think you've both covered it really eloquently. Um, I'm going to jump in with a question that we've had in the chat yep. first, which you might have just answered, but I'll ask you anyway. Uh, with not recognising CE marked goods, um, when we've been happy with it for years, is that a UK government issue or an EU one? Now, before you answer, Howard, I hear that in medical supplies, UK government is being more sympathetic and less harsh, but in construction, they're not. Um, well, without going down the rabbit hole of the Brexit situation, uh, could be could be there for some time. The it is a UK decision um, to. It's fundamental in the in the exit negotiations that UK products um, could not be treated as European products and therefore would not be subject to the European legislation which delivers a CE mark. So whose fault is it? It depends on what side of the argument you were in terms of whose fault it was we didn't get arguably a better outcome from the negotiations. But the fact of the matter is that it is the UK will be um, the market surveillance authority, as in they'll be checking. The European Union is unlikely to come checking the availability of products within the United Kingdom, as we are a third country. Um, so the UK government could give some leniency. As you've pointed out, in the medical industry, there is some leniency there, because I think they're treated as being rather more critical to health than construction and electrical products. Sure. Um, Margaret, there's a comment here about what happens to unsold goods which are CE marked if they can't be bought and installed. I guess before you answer that, be careful about those CE marked after the date of UK CA marking only, uh, which are still available from other uh, sources which are trying to get rid of them, which would not be in EDA membership. But Margaret, well, do you have a comment? I'm not an expert on what ex on, on I'm not an expert on UKCA marking, but the message we're trying to get out now is that anything that is placed on the market already is fine. You can use that. Um, but there are some grey areas that there's a whole working group um, within the Construction Leadership Council, which brings together loads and loads of different trade associations working on this. And I know, Howard, you'll probably have people on that working group um, because there's there's they, there needs to be lack of clarity about being placed on the market and because that's not 100 percent clear. And then there also needs to be clar clarity about when it's, let's say, um, purchased to put in a in a, in a in a project and then maybe it's going to be going in in nine months time or something so there, there are gray areas and I don't really know the answer to that but there are very clever people working to get an answer to that so as soon as we have that answer we'll get it out. Howard I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah I think it probably add on to what I said before um, there is the 12 months afterwards that as I said there, there can be it doesn't have to be on the product but it needs to be in the packaging now this is all all the comments we're making here is reliant on there being market surveillance on the products now absolutely officially to the legal requirement after the dates that we've mentioned those products should not and cannot be sold in the United Kingdom and placed in the market. And I think the, the question, Rob, did come in there is if there's availability of non compliant products, as in CE marked only products, it is, well, the, the question mark is is the, uh, the end client going to check 
those products? Are they going to be happy to have non officially non-compliant products? Now, I think this becomes a lit, the timescales for this comes integrated into the Safer Buildings program. Because by the time we come to the end of 22, ultimately when all this really begins to be a problem, by end of 21 a little bit, and certainly the end of 22, uh, the Building Safety Regulator will be in place, the Construction Products Regulator will be in place, and I think, and this is my personal opinion, by that time, those regulators will be, very, will be on top of all construction products going into certainly cer certain types of buildings, if not many others. So that could, at the two point, you can see how those two timescales will overlap. So we may, there may be some pressures coming in on market surveillance in 22. Uh, but I say these, that's my personal opinion. And we genuinely do not know. Um, but it, I think all I can say is, I think a, I'd like to think that all all ECA members would be looking out for the, the right marking, and would only be placing mark placing their products in their clients' markets, you know, adhering to those the, the relevant marking requirements. I think you're is right there. All? I think it could, we it could get. It could get caught out legally. I think you're right that members of trade bodies, whether it be ECA, EDA or BEMA, are there to do the right thing and comply with their obligations so that they can uh, live up to their contractual obligations upstream. Um, to the last question that we've got, which is about how long we think this will last, I think in talking to Margaret and BEMA uh, prior in preparation to, for the webinar, this is expected to be a bumpy ride. You can see through at least the next 12 months. Uh, in terms of mitigation steps, I think it's about managing both up and downstream. Yeah, uh, I think the fun final thing is the semiconductor. You can see that the uh, distributors and are, and wholesalers are under some considerable pressure here, and so are the manufacturers. Yeah, I think that Oliver. I think we're out of time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Howard, uh, Margaret and Rob. Um, you can watch this recording back on the ECA YouTube channel. Uh, we'll try and get that up this week. If not, it will appear next week. Um, if you've got any further questions, please, please do email them through to myself, oliver.wilkins at eca.co.uk. We'll try and get those answered for you. But um, thank you again to our three panellists and thank you again for joining us today. Okay, thank you.